let me introduce to you the speakers of our first paper presentation. Good afternoon. I am Yayi Fua, and with me are Tring Lokasan and Mariah Manlangi. We will be sharing with you the development process of the multiliteracy assessments for K-3 Filipino children, or MLAF. The MLAF was developed by ERP as part of a research project aimed at closely examining literacy development among kindergarten to grade 3 Filipino children in multilingual contexts. Here is the flow of our presentation. To provide a framework for developing the tool, we considered our educational context, specifically focusing on literacy instruction, including existing assessments for literacy, as well as the research surrounding early literacy development in multilingual contexts. Upon the passing of the K-12 law in 2013, New curricular frameworks were developed by the Department of Education, setting standards and competencies for the different grade levels in different content areas. For language and literacy, standards and competencies were categorized under these 14 domains. For Key Stage 1, or K-3, the most significant aspect of the reform was the implementation of the shift to mother tongue-based multilingual education, or MTB MLE. This allowed literacy instruction to be, con to be conducted in the child's mother tongue with Filipino and English gradually introduced in grades 1, 2, and 3. Also, in the past years, there have been large-scale national and classroom-based assessments that were used to provide information about student achievement in literacy as well as those developed by various researchers for use in smaller samples. What does theory say about early literacy? Preschool to early grades is called the learning to read stage. Emergent literacy describes children's literate behaviors prior to formal schooling that precede and develop into conventional literacy. The most global skills are reading, of reading are word identification and comprehension. Executive function, which includes an array of processes, plays a critical role in the development of academic skills, such as reading. As to what previous studies had to say on literacy learning in multiple languages and on multilingual learners, research tells us that literacy development of learners with more than one language has been found to be substantively different from those of monolingual learners. There is interdependence across literacy skills. And uh, for our own, own context, literacy skills in Filipino and English are predicted by different underlying skills. Progress rates between Filipino and English literacy development differ, but literacy subskills show a high degree of cross-language interdependence. More recent studies showed transparency of the orthography of a language is connected to the development of reading skills, particularly phonological awareness and word reading fluency. It also states that pro proficiency in reading ability in a first language could influence the rate and quality of development in another language. Informed by these theories and studies and in consideration of our educational context, the MLAF assesses the following components. Emergent skills, conventional or global skills that focus more on word reading and comprehension, and executive function, which focus on information processing. Some components had parallel items in Filipino and English, but there are also non-language components. These were administered only once in the child's first language. The components were also distributed according to manner of administration, either by group or individual. The MLAF was also designed as a developmental assessment tool, meaning it was not focused on gathering information on students' literacy achievement, but on their development, including underlying difficulties. The tool, therefore, is not divided into grade levels and is meant to be administered to all children in K-3 to and see how far each, each child can go. Development of the MLAF went through the following process. We surveyed existing tools on the identified components. Most of these were just sitting in libraries or other repositories, but have been validated and used for research. 
we sought permission from authors to use or adapt them. We constructed a table of specifications and created test items using Sukatwika to finalize word level items. Sukatwika is a psycholinguistic analyzer developed by ERP in collaboration with the UP College of Engineering. Revisions were made based on validation of content by experts as well as on a trial run. It was then field tested before the pandemic hit, and the data that we were able to gather were used for item analysis, employing item response and classical test theories as well as ANOVA. This allowed us to decide on which items will remain and which ones should be revised or discarded. Tring and Mariah will share more on this later. The resulting revised version is now called MLAF 2.0. Lessons from the pandemic and the desire to reach more children urged us to reimagine assessment administration. Thus, MLAF 2.0 will be administered in three different modalities, face-to-face, -face, visual remote or online, and telephony. Each version will have three parallel forms, which will be administered at the beginning, middle, and end of year. To share the process for item analysis and selection, I now turn you over to Trin. Thank you, Teacher Yayi. For the phase, first phase of item analysis and selection, data that we obtained from field testing was subjected to item analysis, which is an important step in finalizing the assessment tool. Item analysis allows us to refine and improve the tests by determining which items in the tests performed well and which ones need to be revised. We deployed both the classical test theory, or CTT, and item response theory, or IRT, specifically rash modeling. With CTT, the unit of analysis is the test as a whole, while with rash, analysis can be done at the item or question level. Deploying both models allow us to, allows us to look at each item in relation to the test as a whole. To analyze items, we look at discrimination and difficulty indices. The ranges that are indicated give a description of the test and of particular items, from poor to very good discrimination, or from very difficult to very easy. We also look at indices to determine test reliability. The cells highlighted yellow show which values were flagged. After collating the results of CTT and RASH analysis, items were flagged based on the statistical indices that were mentioned, discrimination, difficulty, and reliability. Flagged items were further analyzed, this time qualitatively. Based on expert judgment, possible underlying issues for poor performance were identified until finally a decision is made to either retain an item, revise, or put them in an item bank. Let's take a look at two cases. Case one is an item from the non-word reading test and is considered a good item, even with the resulting difficulty rating for kinder in grade three. Why is that? In the Philippines, English is not used in kindergarten, as mentioned at the beginning of our presentation and word reading is not a skill expected of kindergartners, which could account for the very difficult rating for kindergarten. By grade three, the learner would already have much exposure to English reading instruction, which could account for the easy rating. This further analysis would allow us to decide to retain this item. Case two is a listening comprehension item with visual stimulus and is flagged based on our indices. Why did this item not perform well? Possible issues include, first, uh, this, these two options do not invoke the kind of thinking required for the item. The mere mention of the bike in the story makes the answer sort of a giveaway, since only one image shows a bike. However, the decision is still to retain the item, but to revise it by replacing the other option. Perhaps with an image of a boy washing or riding a bike, or by adding that option to the existing ones. Aside from the main objective of analyzing the items, the data was also used to initially identify correlations across skills and languages. There were six strong positive correlations across Filipino, 
while there were nine strong positive correlations within English. On the table, we can see that reading comprehension has the most number of correlations, indicating that the ability to read and spell also indicates the ability to also read with comprehension, supporting the literature mentioned in the earlier parts of our presentation. Across the two languages, reading comprehension and word reading are highly correlated, as well as word reading and non-word reading and spelling. Finally, these were the non-language skills with high positive correlations. After these initial analyses, items were further studied. This next phase will be explained to us by Mariah. Your turn, Mariah. Thank you, Teacher Tring. In the second phase of item analysis and selection, we underwent the following steps, first of which was a one-way analysis of variance. This was done in order to examine whether there were any significant differences in the performances of the different grade levels for each test item. The results of this statistical analysis then informed our decision on whether a particular test item was retained or further revised. Following this step, we then ranked the test items in order of their difficulty, which we measured by tallying the total number of learners who answered the item correctly. These items were then distributed across the three alternate forms for each multimodal version. After distributing the test items for all the test components, we then conducted a measure of reliability, both in terms of the test's internal consistency, as well as the reliability of all three alternate forms. We will demonstrate the following steps in the succeeding slides using the English spelling component of the MLAF as an example. The objective of the one-way analysis of variance was to check if the test item could differentiate the four grade levels in terms of their performance. The team established earlier on that any test item that is shown to have a p-value less than 0.1 is deemed significant and is then retained. On the other hand, any test item with a p-value greater than 0.1 is further revised or placed in the item bank. For example, in the spelling test component, we clearly see that item 1 has a p-value less than 0.1. We can also confirm this in the Tuki's post-hoc test, where we see that the kindergarten and grade 1 learners had significantly different mean scores for this item than the grades 2 and 3 learners. After the repeating this procedure for all the test items, we moved on to item ranking. Columns 1 and 2 show the item number and the specific item, while column 3 shows the ranking of items in order of the total number of learners who were able to answer it correctly, as seen in column 4. We also utilized Sukat Wika to note the total frequencies with which these words appear in learning materials used in schools, as seen in the last column. This shows that all our items in our test are the same words that children are exposed to in school. All three forms have a list of common words, which could be used to gauge the learning of our prospective respondents throughout the whole year. Common words that were included were of varying difficulty, with a set number of easy, average, and difficult items based on the item ranking in the previous slide. In addition to this, the remaining words in the list were distributed across the three forms, in order of their total frequencies in Sukatwika. The word with the highest frequency was placed in the beginning of year form, while the word with the lowest frequency was placed in the end of year form, with the understanding that children would have received instruction for the entire school year. This slide shows the final list of items for all three forms of the in-person and visual remote versions of the English spelling component of the MLAF. The common items across the forms are highlighted in green. This process is specific to the in-person and visual remote versions of the test. However, for the telephony version, test components with a large number of items were reduced. We recognize that this could pose the greatest challenge in terms of administration. Therefore, for the telephony version, only the items in the common word list were distributed across the three forms in order to retain a point of comparison across all three multimodal versions. 
Nevertheless, the three forms for the telephony version still contain items of varying difficulty, as shown in the table. Blue items are difficult, green items are average, while yellow items are easy. For the subtests under phonological awareness, we had to take an extra step in item selection. Because phonological awareness included at least 10 items per subtest, we first confirmed whether it was possible to reduce the number of skills that we would include in the test. To do this, we checked the correlations among all the skills under phonological awareness, retaining those with the highest number of correlations to other skills, as they were essentially measuring the same construct. However, we also retained those with little to no correlations with other skills, as they were measuring constructs that were not encompassed by the previous skills mentioned. Here's the final list of subtests included. Finally, to determine the reliability of the alternate forms of the test, we studied both the internal consistency as well as the equivalence across all three forms. For internal consistency, we use the Cooter Richardson 20 formula. This was done in order to ensure that all the test items included in each form are measuring the same skill. Here in this example below, we see that each form of the test is highly reliable with a value that is greater than 0.95. If we look more closely at the sample test item as well, it actually shows that, that the test would become less reliable should the item be removed which confirms our decision of retaining this test item. We also looked into the reliability of the three alternate forms using the Pearson R correlation, with the assumption that a higher R value implies that our three alternate forms are highly reliable and are measuring the same skill. In this example, we see that the three alternate forms for our spelling test are highly correlated with each other with each pair demonstrating R values greater than 0.98 and can thus be considered equivalent forms. Now that the tests have been analyzed and finalized, I turn you over again to Teacher Yai for our next steps. Thanks, Mariah. Next year, we'll be administering the three different versions of MLAF. We want to find out first, can the items remain despite the difference in modalities? Second, if test results across different modalities are comparable. Third, if the MLAF differentiates between good and poor readers among K-3 Filipino children. And last, if the MLAF identifies the correlates of good and poor literacy for K-3 Filipino children. We plan to work with learners both in classroom-based and community-based settings. There are also plans to develop the MLAF in other Philippine languages. It has already been started in Sunigbuanong Binisaya. Simultaneously, we will move on to the development of assessments for grades 4 to 12, starting with consultative discussions to inform the crafting of an assessment framework for this particular group of learners. Our heartfelt gratitude to the following people for partnering with us and lending us their expertise. Here are our references. And that ends our presentation for this afternoon. We hope you were able to find this useful. On behalf of Train, Mariah, and Teacher Dina Ocampo, maraming salamat at magandang hapon po soon. Thank you very much to the team. Um, we would like to invite Teacher Siai and Tring and Miss Mariah to share the floor with us. Please turn on your videos and microphones. I would like now to open the floor for a few questions. We have 10 minutes for question and answer. Um, kindly use the Q&A function, which you should see on your Zoom for this, for this webinar so that you can put in your questions. But for now, let me get the ball rolling. Um, I have, um, I would like to find out how long did it take you to get to the point of determining three versions of administration processes for NMAF? Um, okay. Um, the development of the MLAF actually started before the pandemic. 
and then we were disrupted as everything else was um, at that time. So we were able to use the original version um, until right before the lockdown. However, um, since we cannot assess and we cannot determine with certainty when uh, things will open up again so we can continue with our assessments, we thought it might be best to have different modalities. Uh, but of course, that, have, that would have been based on the item analysis that happened. And we have to distribute all the items in the three different modes and three different forms that was mentioned. So um, pre-pandemic, that was 2019. And then um, a, few, a few months or a few weeks ago, that's when we determined the three forms. And um, hopefully we'll be ready to administer early next year. Thank you, Teach. Um, I'd like to find out who you think will be the most um, likely user of the telephony version. I think for, for those who have um, difficulty with internet connections, connection, but um, you know, are still capable of being reached with a telephone, not smartphone, but the, you know, the ordinary telephone. Um, uh, that uh, that are still being used right now um, in um, those in areas that um, have no connectivity so cannot be assessed online but are also hard to reach physically but can be but can use um, the but can use telephone thanks teach there's a question on the q a and i think um chain might be able to answer this um <laughs> It's from Ivy Mejia. Hi, Ivy. Um, how did you administer the telephone version of the test? And then I'll ask the second question after. Yeah. All right. Uh, we have not yet administered the telephone version of the test. Uh, prior to the pandemic, we were only able to administer face-to-face. -face. Um, in terms of the psychometric properties, I think, uh, no, si Mariah knows that very well so she can explain how we were able to um, get these properties and how similar they are across the three versions so maybe mariah um, can but answer you that did do, but you did do um a telephony version for another research which you uh, just uh visual remote so it was via um zoom actually if the internet was able to um carry the load otherwise uh via Google Meet. So it wasn't telephony um, because there was internet and I used the uh, platform, the video call platform. So maybe the closest experience I have had was when participants used smartphones and then um, sometimes it would rain when we were doing our assessment. So they'd have to turn off the um, video and then I would have to resort to sending a screenshot instead of flashing it on the screen. And then once they were ready, then we would call again so that I was sure that they had the copy ready with them already. So I think that's the closest. Um, in terms of how this was administered, I still followed the manual, um, at least at the time, the same manual for face-to-face -face administration. But for this coming um, three versions, the MLAF version 2.0, um, I think we should be able to um, add um, to the um, protocols based on what we have experienced, not just with how I administered that um, set of, of tools, but also with the other research that we were able to do over the course of the pandemic. Yeah, so there. Uh, maybe the psychometric parts instead uh, uh, the similarity of the three versions. That part, uh, Mariah can answer. Thank you. Hi. So in terms of the psychometric properties, we actually just used the data that we already had on hand um, from the field testing that they did prior to the pandemic. So what we did was, like I said earlier on in the presentation, we actually... Um, distributed the items uh, from those uh, with the data that we had. So from those questionnaires uh, for each test, you would divide the questions um, 
and the items, the test items, according to uh, to the three alternate forms, uh, and then for which would be parallel to for the three multimodal uh, versions. So we don't have, um, I guess, actual data yet. Um, the psychometric properties that we that we tested were just to ensure that the test items, um, as they performed before, would have. Um, I guess we just tried to minimize the effect of the different forms that the different forms could have uh, on the students because we wanted to see whether they would be comparable in the real world setting. So no actual, in, in short, there's no actual data yet, but um, we're hoping to get, uh, we're hoping to have the field testing done um, in the next year. So yeah, that's that's for that. Thank you for answering the first question. Yeah, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, just to add to what uh, Train said a while ago, the telephony version of the MLAF has not been administered yet. So by telephony, we, we mean a purely audio, audio um, assessment, uh, audio administration, since we were assuming that um, those who will be assessed do not have a smartphone with them. So this is for the, you know, the lowest tech available smartphones. Um, the reason why we added telephony, because globally, um, during the pandemic, this was one of the modalities that that was tested in in other countries where there the um there there's a similar situation as as um our context and uh, the there are far away places that they needed to reach so we would like to try that in order to reach um uh, maybe reach more children thanks teacher dina i think that um preparing for assessments that will have to be administered in different modalities is really important um, we know that a pandemic can come again and we, or, a, or a natural disaster. And so we need to be prepared. Um, assessment of learning is also an important aspect of learning recovery. Um, we have, our children have experienced a lot of learning loss. We are unable to establish that loss actually. And so it's important for us to develop these materials and tools to help ourselves monitor. There's a question here. Um, is this a tool that will be designed that needs specialist type of training or minimal training? Perhaps you can answer it from the first version to the next versions. Yeah, the first version of MLA, we, we had to train assessors um, who, admi who administered the, the assessment. Um, there's also a manual available. Uh, we tried to make the manual as user-friendly as possible so that Everything is there. However, um, I think it would be good if uh, the, uh, the assessor would have a basic understanding of literacy components. Um, but in terms of um, using it, um, we, we did, I think training would be, I think training would be a lot of, a lot of help, especially since there will be different modalities already. Um, but uh, we we will we we do try to make the the manual as clear and as user friendly as possible. Thanks, Teach. Um, the next question: As for those, as for who will be included in the sample, does this development reflect students from diverse backgrounds? Yeah, Trin, maybe Trin can answer that from the first to the next mm -hmm. upcoming. Yeah. All right. So for the first uh, version, we did uh, the field trials in both public and private schools, though at that time, um, we were supposed to go on to more of the public school, uh, private schools, but the pandemic happened. So for the first version, um, most of the data that we got came from public schools. So for the next version, the plan is to have a more varied set of um, a more varied sample. So that would mean um, children from private public schools. There is also a plan to go into community-based sampling. So that is something that we did not do for the first version. Okay, we have a couple of comments from Dr. Kevin Carl Santos first. 
Um, he did not catch the reason for having alternate forms. Is it for the three that's test administrations? If so, did you consider the use of test equating to ensure that the scores for the three forms can be compared? Um, I think that's something that we will test, um, as we mentioned uh, during the presentation, if if the results will be comparable for the three modalities. Um, yeah. Since this is the first time that they're, we're going to administer the three modalities, so, so that's something that we will have to look into also. Yeah, I think that's also why there are common items across all the yeah. versions. And then his second comment is regarding comparing the item performance per grade level. Um, if we, if you are doing that, you know, perhaps you need to consider conducting differential analysis, DIF analysis, instead of employing one way and another. So thank you, Kevin. Um, thank you for your comments. For our last, we have one more question. We're over time by a minute, but I'm sure you can do a quick one with this. How do you deal with or plan to do time tests in online or phone version? I'm sorry. Can you repeat the I'll, question, teacher? Dean, I'll repeat sorry. the question. How do you deal with or plan to do time tests in the online or phone versions? Ah, okay. So um, I think we'll, uh, since the online version is, um, we imagine it to be something like this. Uh, we're, we're face to face virtually with, with the, with a learner, so I think it we we would be able to to time it um, in that way. Um, I think Tring was able, maybe Tring was also able to do that when when she when she did um, a version of the M laugh with it. Um, we will also try that over the over the phone uh, with telephony, and then the assessor on the other line will have to time it um, to time um, the, uh, the reading, the passage reading. As as um, or with any other component that needs timing. Okay, thank you very much. I invite the three of you to answer the questions of after after this open forum, um, while we move on to our next presentation. So, everyone, may I join you to please give hearts, claps, and celebrations to Yai, <laughs> Mariah, and Trin. Thank you very much for sharing your thank paper. Thank you so much.